animal or some object, but ourselves. Sacrifice means self-offering. As it says in Hebrews 10, verses 6 to 7, quoting Psalm 40, verses 6 to 7, In burnt offerings and sin offerings thou hast taken no pleasure. Then I said, Lo, I have come to do thy will, O God. Point C. Many people think that the essence of sacrifice lies in the death of the sacrificial victim, lamb, goat or calf, as the case may be. But the true purpose of sacrifice is not death, but life. If the victim is slain, that is not because its death has value as an end in itself, but so that its life may be offered to God. According to the understanding of the Old Testament, the life of an animal or human being resides in the blood, and thus by pouring out the victim's blood, its life was released and made available to be offered up to God. Then point D. A sacrifice in order to be truly a gift or offering, must necessarily be voluntary. That which is taken from us by force against our will is not truly a sacrifice. Now, we can apply all this to the sacrifice of Christ. A. Christ as sacrifice is offered up to God. B. Christ offers himself in sacrifice. C. When he dies on the cross, it is that we may have life. This is made transparently clear when his death on the cross is followed by his life-creating resurrection. D. Christ was not under any compulsion to die, but he freely laid down his life on our behalf. As he says in John chapter 10, verses 15 to 18, I lay down my life for the sheep. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. If Christ had not gone voluntarily to his death, his crucifixion would have been simply a miscarriage of justice, an act of violence, a murder. But because he lays down his life willingly, his death becomes a life-creating sacrifice for the sins of all the world. Underlying the whole notion of sacrifice as voluntary self-offering, there is one all-important factor, love. Why does Christ lay down his life? Out of love. As is said in John 13, 1, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Again, it is said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. Love, then, is the key to the whole idea of sacrifice. Sacrifice is voluntary self-offering inspired by love. Love to the uttermost, love without limits. Recalling our four questions, we may say, there is indeed a danger of stating the sacrifice model in such a way as to suggest that the change is in God, not us. Question one. 
that Christ is separated from the Father? Question two. And that the cross is to be isolated from the rest of our Lord's life? Question three. But this danger is largely avoided if the element of love is emphasised. In that case, Christ's sacrifice is seen as an expression of God's unchanging love. The sacrifice of love alters us, not God. And there is no separation between the Father and the Son. Moreover, the whole of Christ's life, from the Incarnation onwards, is a sacrifice or offering to God. So the cross is not isolated. Closely linked to the idea of sacrifice, there are two other ways of thinking about Christ's saving work. So we come to Model 3, Variant 1. Satisfaction. Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury, who lived from around 1033 to 1109, interpreted Christ's sacrifice in terms of satisfaction. His theory of the atonement has been widely popular, not only in the West but in the East, primarily because it possesses a firmly objective character. See question four. He applied to the atonement the principles of the medieval feudal society in which he lived. Human sin, he argued, has offended God's honour. Satisfaction must be given to the Father in recompense for his offended honour. And this satisfaction has been rendered by Christ on our behalf. For all its popularity, this theory has two grave disadvantages. First, it interprets salvation in legalistic categories rather than as an act of divine love. Second, the notions of honour and satisfaction, while reflecting medieval feudalism, are not to be found in the Bible. Then there is Model 3, Variant 2, Substitution. Unlike Variant 1, the idea of substitution that Christ bears our sins in his own person and suffers instead of us, does indeed possess firm biblical roots. Christ is here seen as fulfilling two Old Testament prototypes. First, he is like the sacrificial scapegoat on whose head were placed the sins of the people before it was driven out into the wilderness. See Leviticus 16, verses 20 to 22. Second, Christ is the suffering servant, described in Isaiah 53, 4 to 7. And that passage is discussed also in Acts 8, 30 to 35. Here Isaiah says, Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his wounds we are healed. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Jesus then, when he suffers and dies on the cross, is taking our sins upon himself and enduring the punishment that we deserve to undergo. And this is what Paul says 
in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, in this substitution model, it is clear that the change is in us, not in God, question one. But we must be careful not to understand the model in such a way as to separate Christ from God, as Billy Graham unfortunately did, question two. Also, there is a danger that the idea of substitution may turn Christ's work of salvation into a transaction that is somehow external to us, in which we are not directly and immediately involved. Jesus does indeed suffer for our sins, but we need to be associated with his act of sacrificial suffering and to make that act our own. It is legitimate to say, Christ, instead of me. But we should balance that by saying, Christ, on behalf of me. And also, Christ in me and I in him. Substitution language should be combined with the language of indwelling. Now we turn to model four, victory. Here, Christ's work of salvation is seen as a cosmic battle between good and evil, between light and darkness. Dying on the cross and rising from the dead, Christ is victor over sin, death and the devil. The victory is summed up in the last word that he spoke on the cross, teteleste, which is usually translated, it is finished. See John 17, verse 30. But this is not to be seen as a cry of resignation or despair. Christ is not just saying, it's all over, this is the end. But he is affirming, it is accomplished, it is fulfilled, it is completed. For other examples of the victory motif, see Colossians 2.15. God disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it, that is, through the cross. And see also Ephesians 4, 8. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. That is actually a quotation from Psalm 68, 18. The father who particularly uses the idea of victory is St. Irenaeus of Lyon at the end of the second century. If you want to see the idea of victory lived out, then think above all of the Paschal Midnight Service, with its constant refrain, Christos anesti ek necron, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death. Think also of the marvellous sermon attributed to St John Chrysostom, read at the end of Matins or at the liturgy, with its overwhelming sense of triumphant joy. The same note of victory is found in Latin hymns for Pascha. Death and life have contended in that combat tremendous. The prince of life who died reigns immortal. There's a traditional story told from the early days of persecution in Russia that illustrates the theme of Paschal victory. An atheist uh, lecturer came to a village and all the inhabitants were assembled to listen to him. He explained to them at great length 
that there is no God? And he said at the end, are there any questions? At the back of the audience, the parish priest stood up and said, I'd like to say something. The atheist lecturer, sensing trouble, told him, You must be very brief. I will only allow you half a minute. Oh, said the priest, I don't need nearly as much time as that. What I wanted to say is this. Christ is risen. All the audience shouted back, He is risen indeed. Then the priest turned to the atheist lecturer with the words, That's all I wanted to say. Such is our answer to the world's misery. The risen Christ is victor over darkness and despair. The great advantage of this victory model is that it holds together the cross and the resurrection. They are seen as a single event, an undivided drama. Already, when Christ dies on the cross, it is a victory. But the victory is at that moment hidden. When the myrrh-bearing women come on the third day to the tomb and find it empty, and when Christ appears before them once more alive, Matthew 28, 9, then the victory is made manifest. This victory model has, however, a difficult side. It can sound militaristic. It seems that the saving work of Christ is being understood in terms of superior force, of coercive power. So we need to say that the death and resurrection of Christ are indeed a victory, but a victory of a very unusual kind. What we have on the cross is the victory not of superior force, not of military might, but of suffering love. On the cross, Christ is victorious through his weakness, through his self-emptying, through his kenosis, to use the Greek term. So a victory, yes, but a kenotic victory. This becomes clear when we link the cry of Christ on the cross, it is finished, teteleste, John 19.30, with what is said by the evangelist before the account of the Passion. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, John 13.1. The word for end here is the noun telos, which comes from the same root as the verb teteleste, it is finished. Now, everything in St. John's Gospel ties up together. When I was at school, our history master had a favourite phrase. He used to say, in his curiously high-pitched voice, it all ties up, you see, it all ties up. That's a good way to teach history, and it's also a good way to study the Bible. So when Christ says, it is finished, teteleste, the evangelist intends us to think back to what was said four chapters earlier. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end, is telos. From this, we understand exactly what is finished on the cross, what is fulfilled. It is the victory of love. Despite all the suffering, physical and mental, inflicted upon him, Jesus goes on loving humankind. His love is not changed into hatred. We are to see the victory then, not as a military victory, but as the victory of suffering love, unchanging love, love without limits. As the Protestant theologian Karl Barth said, 
the Christian God is great enough to be humble. And that's what we see above all in his victory on the cross. God is never so strong as when he is most weak. So now, let us come to Model 5, Example. Just as the satisfaction model of the atonement is associated with the particular Latin writer Anselm of Canterbury, so our fifth model is likewise associated with another Latin writer, Peter Abelard, Anselm's younger contemporary. He lived from 1079 to 1142 or 43. Abelard sees Christ's life and sacrificial death as the supreme example of love in action. Love, so he maintains, is deeply attractive, and in this way the love of God shown in Christ's life and death evokes the response of love in us. As is said in the Anglican hymn that I used to sing as a child, O oh, dearly, dearly has he loved and we must love him too. Christ's love, made manifest supremely on the cross, acts as a spiritual magnet, drawing us all to him. As Christ says in John twelve thirty two, I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. A great many Western Christians in modern times have been attracted by this fifth model because it moves completely away from the notion of God as angry, jealous, vindictive and bloodthirsty. 